This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, first things first, it is an honor and privilege that you decided to join us for another Farm Monitor because without you folks, none of this would be possible. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the program. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. As always, we've got a lot of good stuff to show you today. Coming up just when they needed it most, young farmers and ranchers affected by the recent wildfires in the southeast get some major help from Monsanto. Details on the way. And also on the program, if you like digging through farm fields looking for arrowheads, then you're going to love this story. Hear from a longtime collector on ways to make your hunt a successful one. And then later, her caring ways have given new hope to veterans, and it's caught the eye of the National 4-H Council. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Our Georgia Farm Bureau, along with the Georgia Governor's Office of Highway Safety and the Georgia Department of Agriculture, want drivers to be aware of farm equipment on Georgia roadways. The public is encouraged to slow down, don't be distracted, and give farm equipment plenty of room on the roads as farmers travel from field to field. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has more. As the weather warms up and field work gets in full swing, many tractors and other farm vehicles are traveling the roads of Georgia. It is very important for farmers to be able to use roadways, and it is also very important for motorists to be safe. We want the public to make sure that they realize if they live in an agricultural area or are driving in an agricultural area that they might encounter a slow moving farm vehicle. Often drivers get irritated behind slow tractors and other equipment, but Georgia officials want the public to understand the rules of the road. It's their right to be on that road just as much as it is our right to be driving on it. And we want to make sure people see those vehicles. Farmers who are moving equipment on the road use safety measures. Reflective triangles and flashing lights are used so drivers can have plenty of warning. Tractor might be moving at 20, 25 miles an hour. Cars moving at 50 to 60 to 70 miles an hour and physics will tell you that that's a dangerous situation when you can't stop that car and you're approaching that, that tractor. President of the Georgia Farm Bureau, Gerald Long, grew up in a rural county and knows that farmers have a lot on their minds during the growing season, but he encourages producers and others in the public to be alert. Most farms now are so diversified and spread out, we have to be on the highways quite a bit. And it is definitely a challenge moving equipment as we moved into larger equipment uh, takes up more the the right of way and all, trying to dodge mailboxes as we're going down the road and then trying to dodge cars. Recently, a public service announcement was produced and it will run on television stations around Georgia to help spread awareness of tractor safety. Well, I think we got to be a little more aware of what's going on around us because we tend to forget sometimes when we get on the road, we're trying to get to that next field to try to get it planted or hair haired, whatever we need to do. And we tend to sort of forget that, uh, you know, other people on the road, that they have a right just like we do. And we need to be aware of that and be very cautious. As more farm equipment is traveling on the roads and more motorists are traveling, the goal is for everyone to get to their destinations safe and sound. There are numerous distractions that can, can take your mind and your eyes off of that road for just a brief time and all of a sudden you look up and there's a tractor or other farm implement and we want people to know that it can be dangerous not only for them but dangerous for the operator of that tractor. I encourage you as drivers to be on the vehicles be very cautious when you come up or even coming toward a, a piece of farm equipment to slow down and watch what's coming on because a lot of times you got a car coming from behind one meeting you and one's trying to pass the other one and there's not enough room on the highway for, for all three of them to pass at the same time. So be very cautious about that, if you will. I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Mark, thank you very much. In other ag news, Monsanto donates big in a time of need. Michael Clements has more in this American Farm Bureau Minute. 
The American Farm Bureau Federation expresses its appreciation to Monsanto for its generous wildfire relief donation to be shared equally among Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas Farm Bureaus. $50,000 of the $200,000 donation is earmarked for the Young Farmer and Rancher Wildfire Relief Fund in place to help beginning and young farmers and ranchers in the four affected states. AFBF Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee Chair Colina Bruce says any beginning or young farmer or rancher impacted by the fires can qualify for the relief fund. Those that will be eligible for these funds will be all beginning and young farmers who don't have to be a Farm Bureau member to qualify. That application process isn't quite finalized yet and we'll have that available for people in the next two weeks. If you get wiped out all at once, it's really easy to just say, well, maybe farming's just not for us and let's move on. And we really want to encourage those young farmers, beginning farmers, to stay within our industry and to rebuild. Bruce says the donation by Monsanto will ensure a vibrant future for farmers and ranchers in the affected areas. Michael Clements, Washington. Meantime, seminars from industry leaders, the largest livestock trade show in the state, and even a comedian. Yes, this year's Georgia Cattlemen's Association Convention and Beef Expo had it all. Damon Jones was there and tells you why it's so important for cattlemen to attend this event. You don't have to ask where's the beef at the Perry National Fairgrounds as the Georgia Cattlemen's Association recently held their convention and expo. Cattlemen had the opportunity to buy and sell, network, and listen to the latest updates on the industry. So there's uh, new issues that arise, there's new technologies that come in to help, and those things are changing every single day because we have folks uh, at some of the, the research uh, land-grant universities in the southeast, like University of Georgia, that are always putting in work to make it more efficient and more profitable for cattlemen. And so we have try to provide that information here, how to make your operation better. That research information ranged from forage to safety on the farm, and while it benefits everyone in attendance, it was especially important for the younger generation. We've got to keep up with the technology. Uh, we've got an ever-changing industry uh, with young minds that, you know, graduate in college, and they're overtaking grandpa's farm and mom and dad's farm, and so you're going to have a little uh, feedback from there between one generation to the next in ways of doing things. And to get things done, you need the best and most up-to-date equipment possible. You can find that and more at this trade show, which is the largest of its kind in the state. So we have over 100 vendors, and, and that's important because it covers the entire gamut of our industry, um, from, from Baylor twine all the way to, to pharmaceuticals and everything in between. Um, we've got a lot of large equipment because that technology is also changing every single day. So this is a great opportunity uh, for, for cattlemen to come out, uh, see what's new, see what they might want to implement on their farms and, and take back home. While there were plenty of classes to attend and things to look at, this year's convention wasn't all business as those in attendance got treated to a few laughs as well. Then we also have uh, Jerry Carroll, who is an ad comedian that's going to provide a little bit of entertainment, which is something new for us. Uh, we've always been pretty heavy on uh, education, but this time we're going to have a little bit of fun with the speaker. And then we've got uh, Strand Smith also, who is the world tie-down champion. Even though there was plenty to learn at this convention, it's really the connection these farmers make that's really important. It's pretty, uh, you know, pretty few and far between for opportunities to come out and network like this where everybody here is going to be in the same industry, going to have the same passion, the same, um, um, same care for, for what you do. That passion was put to the test in a difficult 2016 that saw prices fall and an uncooperative Mother Nature. We didn't know what was in store for us in the, in the fall ahead when we encountered a severe drought, a uh, shortage of hay and grass. We had a couple of hurricanes on the east side of the, the state. Uh, we had a tornado in the winter that came up through South Georgia. Despite that trying 2016, confidence is high heading into the new year. The, the cattle market is, is steadily increasing. Uh, we've still got a ways to go to, to, to really see a huge profit margin, but um, there's optimism on that level. Uh, obviously this time of year when you're in March and April, you're coming into the spring season and so there's an optimism of, of grass growing, future hay production and crops going in the ground. Reporting from the Perry National Fairgrounds, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, great job. Now still to come on the monitor, why the National 4-H Council selected this Fort Valley team for one of the highest honors. But first, if there's a farm field loaded with Indian artifacts, he will find them. A collection you have to see to believe when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues.
The Georgia Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture recently held its third annual gala event. It brought many people from around Georgia who support the foundation and its mission. The executive director of the GFB Foundation for Agriculture is Katie Gazda, who thanked all the supporters and updated them on all the good work the foundation is doing in communities around the state. The foundation is based on four pillars, scholarships, consumer outreach, agriculture in the classroom, and leadership development. Each and every initiative of the foundation touches on one or more of these pillars and serves to support our greater mission of spreading agricultural literacy throughout Georgia's communities. Over the past year, thanks in large part to our county volunteers and friends of the foundation, we have steadily worked to achieve this mission. In 2016, we awarded over $50,000 in scholarships to deserving students pursuing degrees in agriculture. For the first time ever, we expanded our reach from graduating high school seniors to also encompass juniors and seniors in college, technical college students, and students studying large animal medicine at the UGA College of Veterinary Medicine. Along with that update, the grand champions were recognized for many different livestock competitions. GFP Foundation for Agriculture is a proud supporter of livestock competitions and provides each grand champion with a cash prize and a belt buckle. If you want to support the GFP Foundation for Agriculture, just go to gfbfoundation.org. Deep beneath the soil of America's farmland lies the buried secrets of ancient Indian history. As one person told me, it is not uncommon for a farmer to be plowing a field and stumble upon some artifact, forcing him or her from the tractor to retrieve it. But finding those artifacts such as arrowheads is easier said than done. That's why when you see and hear the story of Moultrie's Johnny Dickerson, your first response will be, that is amazing. Behind this door and on display is what can only be described as a labor of love. For as long as he can remember, Johnny Dickerson has been venturing into nearby farm fields looking for Indian artifacts. His findings have resulted in one of the most impressive and diverse collections one has ever laid eyes on. I really don't know exactly, but I was young, maybe nine, ten, and believe it or not, picking cotton in a field with a sack, not with a cotton picker. And uh, I would find the arrowhead and I would say, good gracious, somebody, they, nobody's touched this thing in thousands of years. And I'd put it in my pocket and I'd get home, I'd put it in a drawer. And I had a few arrowheads and then, then I just quit. Actually, it was more like an extended hiatus. After serving in the Navy, Johnny then found work with an irrigation firm installing pivots. That's when he says his passion for hunting arrowheads was renewed. The owner of the irrigation firm, which was Cloudburst Irrigation, he, uh, he collected Indian artifacts. So it got me back enthused about doing this again. And then we started going, at, him and I started going off. We'd go everywhere hunting arrowheads. I'd all, we'd, we'd always go to the high side of the creek after a farmer had plowed his field and it rained on it. We'd, we would walk. We wouldn't look over four feet in either direction. And we, had, we were pretty successful. Uh, enjoyed it and still enjoy it. And it's just, it's just something to me to be able to pick up something that somebody has not touched in maybe as much as 10,000 years. And for a first time Indian artifacts hunter like myself, the thrill of trying to find an arrowhead is simply amazing. Now, if you're out in the field and come across something like this, don't be confused. This is not actually an arrowhead. These are flint chips that according to Johnny are the result of the Indians making those arrowheads. Well, that's hard flint right there. See, look at there. This is patina, this is not. This is a harder flint than this flint. I can be walking and not see an arrowhead, but I feel it. I feel it, it's coming. And it won't be a second later, you'll reach down and pick one up. And you, you've not looked at it, but you know it's there, it just draws you to it. And uh, I guess that's the Indian spirit coming out in me or something, because my grandmother was full-blooded Lower Creek, my daddy was half Lower Creek, and I guess I'm a quarter.
first of all, you need to hunt Indian artifacts near a creek, river, natural sink. A natural sink is where you see a bunch of uh, cypress trees, usually around the natural sink. But the water is got that tannic acid and it's black, clear water. And uh, you got to apply as fill. It needs a good rain. We like about two to three inches of rain on it. We know that they'll be sitting up like golf tees when, when, you, when you let it rain on it a while. But then you can't wait till he lays by. They, that means they roll it one more time up, get, get a little dirt up closer to the root of the plant, and uh, then it rains, and then you can go again. It's just like a new field. And every year is going to be different. I have picked up 100 this year and maybe 150 the next year. Uh, so they just don't, they don't run out. So you don't accumulate this in the day. You know, you got to work at it. And, uh, but I enjoy it. If it was a job, I wouldn't do it. Uh, just a reminder, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Fire Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And of course, once you're done watching all those great stories, just keep clicking. Like the Georgia Fire Monitor Facebook page. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, feel free. Send us a message either on Facebook or at the address you see there on the screen. That is news at farm monitor Dot com. Because of her, thousands of veterans now have a reason to smile. After the break, the incredible project that earned this Georgia teen the highest award given by the National 4-H Council. It's well known that the cherry trees around the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. were a gift from Japan. Less well known is that these trees were not part of that original gift there were problems with that shipment. The trees arrived in Washington in January of 1910. They were inspected by USDA inspectors who found a number of uh, serious pests. So they were burned on the mall here in Washington. And of course that created quite a political debacle. Two years later, these pest-free trees arrived, but the earlier debacle had a silver lining. That led to the Plant Quarantine Act which became the basis for the quarantine system that we have today. So the first gift of cherry trees from Japan ushered in a new era of plant health in the United States. USDA partners with other agencies to safeguard against the introduction of invasive species, which cause $120 billion a year in damage to farms, forests, cities, and suburbs. But they can't do it alone. That's an important message for visitors to the annual Cherry Blossom Festival. We get a million to a million and a half people here. It's our job to educate and to inform and help people understand the importance to that. This is a wonderful display. The idea is you put your face in the hole, but when you do, when you get that photograph of your face, you also see the image of the pest that we need our fellow citizens to all help look out for. The kind of thing that could really do damage to our national forests, to our forestry industry, farms, etc. If you missed the display, you can learn more at HungryPests.com. In Washington, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Pat O'Leary. Well, finally today, Operation Veteran Smiles, a program started five years ago by Fort Valley 4-H'er Amelia Day, who came up with the idea during a visit to the Dublin VA hospital with her father. The initiative has served more than 4,000 veterans and engaged more than 6,500 volunteers nationwide to hand deliver custom care packages, notes of encouragement, and musical therapy to veteran patients. And it's because of this that day was recently honored in Washington, D.C. as this year's National 4-H Council Youth in Action Award winner. When I went with my dad to his appointment at the VA hospital, I saw that there were a lot of veterans in their wheelchairs and out in the hallways and they were just sitting there. They weren't, you know, they weren't really doing anything and I was kind of wondering why. When these veterans go to receive their treatment, 
they're oftentimes alone or they don't have any family, family members or friends who can come and visit them every day because there's only 159 VA hospitals in the U.S. So for a lot of these veterans, they have to travel you know, hundreds of miles away to go receive treatment. So from that, I decided to create Operation Veteran Smiles because seeing how those veterans who've gone and sacrificed so much to protect us and our freedoms were just sitting there with no one to talk to, no family members to give them a hug, or nothing, like they didn't have anything to smile about. And that's where this project, Operation Veteran Smiles, came from. And it originally started with a delivery of handmade cards. And when we delivered those, I noticed that a lot of them didn't have the personal hygiene items that they needed. So that's when we started to make the hygiene care packages. And we have delivered those to each one of the veterans at the Dublin VA Hospital. And each veteran receives a hygiene care package and a handmade card from someone in the state of Georgia. And from that, this project, I've seen so many smiles from these veterans. And it's really cool to see how these people have gone overseas and have fought for us and fought for our freedoms to protect our country. And they're smiling and thanking all of the volunteers who have come to deliver these items. Said, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming and visiting. Because that was just really cool to see how they had just an incredible, this big smile on their face because somebody took some time out of their day and thought about them and thought about them enough to make a card or to pack a care baggage. Since 2012, we have had a lot, a lot of people have come and became involved in this project. And I think it's really cool because like for me, I didn't think that I could have that big of an impact, but seeing how I just started making cards or care packages and seeing how all these people want to become involved, I think it's really cool. I think it was so cool that this project has become noticed, has been noticed on a national level. And I just think it's really neat because I don't want people to look at the project and look at me and saying, oh, she's doing such a great thing. I want people to look at the veterans and saying they really need our attention and we would like to give them our attention through this project. I guess what my message, what I want people to really know is that, first of all, 4-H can help you do so many things. 4-H, I believe that in 4-H there's something for everyone. And in 4-H, I learned that my thing is wanting to help people. And I want people to know that our veterans, there are so many veterans who are sitting in VA hospitals who do not have the support like we have every day. And I don't want people to forget about that part of our community because both my granddads are veterans and my dad's a veteran. And so I really think that they deserve our attention. And I really think that with 4-H, we can give them the attention that they deserve. And so I don't want to be one of those kids who read about it on you know, social media and stuff and think, oh, that's terrible, I wish somebody would do about it. I want to be the one to go and have that impact and I want to be the one to get people involved and make even a greater impact at that. She is amazing, isn't she? That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and here on the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week, same time, same channel, right here on the Farm Monitor. Enjoy your week.